Hi everyone and welcome to the past, present and future of cloud native API gateways. My name is Daniel Bryant, I'm the product architect at DataWire and I'll be the presenter for this session. I always like to do a high level TLDR for my talks, kind of set the direction where we're going to go and provide some key takeaways early on. Edge gateways have undergone a series of evolutions driven by architecture. When I say edge gateways, I mean the gateways at the edge of your data center that are getting traffic from users to your backend systems. Over the past 20 or so years, architectures have clearly changed. Adopting microservices and Kubernetes, moving to that cloud na native way of working, not only changes the architecture, microservices and functions, but also the workflow changes too. And therefore you need to choose your cloud API gateway solution intentionally. And the kind of hidden message in this talk really is it's not just about the cloud native API gateway, it's about any part of your platform. The change in architecture, the change in workflow dictate different requirements to our platform components. So you need to think about the API gateway. You also need to think about the way you do continuous delivery and the way you observe your system too. But this talk is primarily focused on, on the ingress gateway. This is me at Daniel Bryant UK on GitHub, Twitter, and so forth. I work as a product architect at DataWire. I also do a lot of work in the Java space, uh, right for InfoQ. I've done a book with my buddy, Abraham Marin Perez. Uh, you can find me on Twitter and the DataWire Slack and on the Kubernetes Slack. If you want to chat, please do reach out to me. So when I say the edge in this talk, I'm talking about the boundary between your data center and your users. Edge is one of those kind of overloaded terms, but this is what I mean when I'm talking about edge in, in this talk. Now the thesis, as I mentioned at the TLDR, is that the evolution of the edge has been driven by application architecture over the past 25 years or so. So you think back to 1995, I was actually in high school here, but just getting into doing a bit of work on the side. Uh, I was loving Java. I was doing a lot of Java, uh, J2EE, Java monolithic applications. Back in the, you know, in the 90s, we weren't even sure if the web, the web browser was going to be the delivery mechanism. Applets were there and a bunch of other things too. But fundamentally, it was a client server type architecture with a database in the back end. In front of these monolithic applications were hardware load balancers. The primary target user was sysadmins. It wasn't developers. The purpose was mainly focused on high availability and scalability. You, know, you may have multiple things at the back end running and you would load balance user traffic across them. And if one thing failed, you'd route accordingly. Back in the you know, in 2000s, um, this is similar architecture, you know, .NET, Java, monolithic client server approaches. This is when we started to see the rise of software proxies, software edge gateways. So HA proxy in 2001, Nginx doing, both doing fantastic work uh, in the early 2000s. The software load balancer was still targeting sysadmins. It was kind of you know, pre-DevOps. DevOps wasn't really a thing back then. Purpose was still very much the same as the hardware load balancers, high scalability, high availability, and it offered very much the same features. But the beauty of being software was it was more malleable, you could easily, more easily configure it, and it also was often cheaper to run. You didn't require dedicated hardware anymore to run the actual load balancer. 2005 time, this is when I sort of started my career, just finished college or university, uh, Web 2.0 was all the rage. As silly as it may seem now, this was massive. I did a lot of work in the e-commerce space, a lot of work with Google Maps too. Ajax was a big thing. Anyone who talks about Ajax probably shows their age like me, but this was a really big thing. It drove interactivity with the web, which we hadn't seen before, with the standard request and response model. Pre-Ajax, it was all, I make a request, I get the response back. I make another request, I get a whole HTML page back. Ajax and the uh, XML HTTP request object fundamentally changed all this. We could make smaller calls and dynamically update our web page. And this at the time was, was revolutionary. It did put more strain on the back end though. No longer were we doing one big request and response. You were now doing the initial re big request and response, but lots of smaller requests to fill in bits of the uh, web page and the DOM dynamically. So this drove the rise of something called an application delivery controller, ADC. The pr primary uh, target again was still sysadmins, -admin but it was all about acceleration at the application level. So high availability, uh, SSL offload, TLL, TLS offload as we say now, lots of caching aggressively, compression, you know, zipping all the responses and, and still doing some of that load balancing stuff too. F5, Nginx doing a lot of work in this space with big IP and, and things. And of course, F5 now own Nginx, which is, is quite interesting too. But these are the kind of primary two um, hardware and software providers. To be fair, there was many others as well, but these are the two I bumped into the most in my work in London. 
2010 time, this is the rise of the kind of I generation and the proliferation of APIs. You know, it's doing a lot of work with Google Maps, a lot of work with Stripe and, and so forth. And this is when we started to see the API gateway pop up, you know. The target now is not only sysadmins at the edge of the systems, but it was API developers too. Kong started popping up, Mashape and so forth. Um, there was an ecosystem developing around these APIs. You know, could we monetize these APIs? And this gateway was very much focused, was evolving around this concept. It looked more at the layer seven protocol. Typically this was HTTP, but it was looking at the HTTP application level protocol to do interesting things. Based on HTTP headers, it would route accordingly. Pre this, it was mainly layer four, IPs and, and so forth. There was lots of interest around dev portals, analytics, how do you monetize? And, and this is really the first generation of when we started to see this kind of hybrid sysadmin and developer focused product at the edge. 2015, this is when we started to see some of the challenges with scaling, particularly, you know, like Rails um, uh, apps. I did a lot of work with Rails, love Rails. Um, but, you know, Twitter in particular was struggling with the Ruby on Rails app. I was doing a lot of work consulting at the time and seeing similar things. Rails was fantastic to get you up and running quickly, but as your system took more load, it was actually quite challenging to scale at a certain point. And this is when the rise we saw, you know, the monolith kind of being becoming a router and pulling out these mini services. You know, people weren't calling it microservices perhaps at this time, but they were pulling out services. They had an application delivery controller doing, you know, TLS offload and doing caching up front, but the monolith, you know, was still doing a chunk of work, typically auth and so forth, but it was um, routing out to individual services to sort of fill in um, bits and pieces of the requests being sent back to the user. This is when you see the rise of the second generation of, of API Gateway. It takes some of the routing and cross-functional concerns away from the, the monolith, the mini-lith, as we're saying here, and, and pulls them into a single location. Before, you know, every piece of traffic was going through the monolith. You know, Twitter's monorail, it was making routing decisions. And therefore, you wanted to extract some of that functionality into an API Gateway to allow you to shrink down that monolith. And, and this is what we saw with the, the rise of second-gen API Gateways. Users, still the same deal. Sysadmins, DevOps, as it was being sort of called now, API developers, very much in the mix here too. You wanted to centralize cross-cutting app concerns, so things like auth and rate limiting, you didn't want to do them in each microservice or each mini service, you wanted to pull them up into a gateway. Authentication, rate limiting, monitoring and routing, these were the main kind of features on, on offer with this second gen API gateway. So into cloud native applications is what we all know and love, that's what we're here for at KubeCon. A lot of us are focusing on modularization. You know, it's not new per se, like David Parnas talked about this in the 70s, and I'm sure folks before him have talked about it as well. But our latest incarnation of modularization is microservices. They are built, released, and operated by independent teams. That's the beauty of microservices. We can split up our application, we can work independently on it, we can release independently, and we can scale independently. As microservices have become popular, there's been a rise of interest around things like container technology, Kubernetes. I did a bunch of work on Mesos pre this kind of thing. It does create some more challenges with matching up the user's requests to the back end services. There's different locations now. Your apps might be running in Kubernetes and VMs in function as a service. You know, there's more protocols that have popped up. No longer do you have to have just one protocol and one monolith. You can have you know, multiple services, each doing different protocols, each doing different, um, being specialized in different functionality. We see different load balancing requirements. You know, some of the particularly more the heritage apps I work with, you have to have sticky sessions because that's just the way the app works. Some of the more modern microservices, you can, you know, round robin, no problem at all. And there's often different auth requirements. Again, backend systems, heritage systems that have been around for a long time often integrate with custom, you know, auth solutions and so forth. And you need to support that as well as supporting the more modern, you know, auth zero or OTCA type um, integrations as well with, with IDPs. So this notion of a cloud gateway, which I introduced you know, up front, it needs a bunch of different things. You need the API gateway type management capabilities, you know, authentication, dev portal, metrics. That's very much for sort of for the developers. You also need operational support like ADC like traffic management capabilities. You need that sort of resilience, that timeouts, there's retries, there's rate limiting, that kind of thing. And as hinted on the previous slide, you also need to weave in this real time service discovery 
We all know and love containers and Kubernetes and working on ephemeral hardware and cheap commodity hardware, but it means things fail all the time in the cloud, as, as the cliche goes. So you need to make sure that a request coming in and being routed to a target, that that target still exists. This means the typical cloud native API gateway you see now is a combination of a bunch of these things from the past. You've, we're weaving in these kind of the, the primitives of hardware and software load balances. We're weaving in application delivery controller acceleration functionality into the API gateway. Clearly there's API management needed as well. And there's also this dynamic ser service discovery. The biggest challenge though is microservices lead to an even bigger change at an architecture and a workflow level. Developers are now on call. It's not always popular in some of the places that I go into, but we are being encouraged to own the services we write. Yeah, Netflix talk a lot about this notion of full cycle development. They see to clearly still, still value operations. They clearly still value um, platform teams, but they are very much supporting teams. These teams create platforms, create APIs, create automation and so forth. And we as developers can consume that in a self-service manner to get our job done, release functionality to the end user. Application teams fundamentally have a responsibility and hopefully the authority for delivering a service right from you know, coding, testing, deploying, releasing. This increased agility increases the feedback loop. And that's what we all want in this you know, modern world, right? You've read the book by Dr. Nicole Forsgren, Accelerate, Jess Humble, Dave Farley have done a lot of work in this space, Gene Kim. You know, there's a good correlation with getting fast feedback and you know, doing, delivering a lot of value and having a, a high performing organization. This is a change in workflow. Just to re-emphasize this, you know, we, clearly the architecture is changing somewhat as well, as you've seen sort of over the history. But microservices is fundamentally about scaling developer productivity. And, and we really not only have to think about the architecture with our API gateway now, our edge gateway, we have to think about the workflow. And this, you know, we kind of have to update the thesis now. The evolution of the edge will be driven by application architecture and the development workflow. And this leads to a couple of challenges we've seen quite a lot at the DataWire team when folks try to adopt a cl uh, cloud native gateway in the Kubernetes space. So the two biggest challenges we've seen at the edge with Kubernetes and microservices. The first one is scaling the edge management. You know, back when I was working on my Java monolith, the development team and I, we owned the whole monolith. We owned things like auth and the tracing and the rate limiting and the circuit breaking. They were typically implemented as Java libraries. So if we want to change them, no biggie. We just change them in the code. The API gateway was typically owned by the ops team. You know, and sometimes we did need to change the API gateway, maybe open a port to do some kind of new protocol support. And to do that, we just raise a ticket. Ops would then have a look, give us some feedback and eventually complete it. You know, and, and we had to bear some of these things in mind when we were going to release functionality. We had to sort of, you know, make sure we raised the ticket early enough in the, in the cycle to get those new changes out. But this was kind of how we worked in, in the monolithic days. Obviously, now we're pulling up a lot of these cross-cutting concerns like auth, tracing, caching and so forth into the API gateway. They're no longer libraries, but I as a developer still need to interact with these things. You know, these things maybe they're core to the experience of how the application, how the backend services work. Now, not only is these things being pulled up into this API gateway, which ops you know, often owns, the challenge is there's more and more services being spun up. You know, if I've got 10 microservices, 20, 30, 40, whatever, if I'm raising tickets to all the ops folks, this is actually you know, going to be a way to slow the feedback cycle down. Really, we as developers need this self-service way of configuring the various um, edge management properties, you know, configuring what we want when we expose our API. And this kind of leads on to the second challenge we've seen about supporting diverse edge requirements. With microservices, I don't have to just run REST across all my you know, platform. I can run REST on one service. I want, say, a strong contract and some streaming capability, gRPC for the next service. And then I might want, say, WebSockets for like an online chat thing as well. And that's not a problem because we've each got individual microservices on the teams. We can choose the right tool for the job, the right protocol for the job, and, and off we go. Now, we still want to mix and match various cross-cutting concerns with these edge requirements. So I might want, say, auth on all my services, maybe accept a marketing service where, you know, you just kind of rock up and you get the marketing info, no auth required. I might want retries on my um, REST or my JSON over HTTP API, but I don't want retries on my, um, you know, gRPC uh, API, for example. So I need some way of configuring these things in, in a scalable, in a scalable way, too. 
Broadly speaking, in the work I've done with, with DataWire and, and consulting as well, there's three strategies we see for folks when they're moving to this cloud native way of working and they realize they want to update the way they're working at the edge. They've adopted Kubernetes, say. The three strategies we see in this space is folks either deploy an additional Kubernetes API gateway, like a new gateway in their Kubernetes cluster. They either extend their existing API gateway solution, and some folks also deploy an in-cluster edge stack. And we see a lot of greenfield projects, very much number three, but we see a lot of heritage projects, one, two, doing their thing, and some of them are also migrating the way to three. And it'll become clear as I walk through these strategies briefly now why folks are doing this. There's, there's pros and cons for all of these approaches here. Now, I'm only going to cover this in like 10 minutes or so. So if you want to know more, I've written a, a blog post. You can find it on the Ambassador blog, on IT Next, a bunch of other places as well. I go into much more depth that the team and I have kind of done quite a bit of thinking about this and chatted to lots of end users and lots of customers. So you can download a, a PDF, a deep dive into some of the ideas that I'll kind of do a whistle stop tour of now. So the first solution is deploying an additional Kubernetes API gateway. And this is literally, you know, simple as it sounds. You deploy an additional in-cluster gateway. You either do it below the existing gateway. You can see in the image on the left, we've got our you know, traditional stack above. And then we spun up a new Kubernetes cluster. We put a new gate gateway in. And the existing API gateway simply passes through, routes through traffic targeted at the Kubernetes cluster without doing anything. And the, gate, the old gateway still routes through to the existing system for other functionality. You can also deploy this under the layer 4 load balancer. So sometimes folks will have like a, a, a big IP type load balancer up front or a global load balancer, these kind of things. And you can simply then route to the old API gateway at a layer 4 level or, or the new Kubernetes gateway. This is kind of good if you're doing IP addresses and subdomains, that kind of stuff. You can do it at the kind of layer 4 level of routing. Now the pros for this, there is minimal changes to the core edge infrastructure and incremen incremental migration is pretty easy in this uh, example. The cons, however, is there is increased management of working with two gateways. As much as it's easy to spin up a new Kubernetes cluster, spin up a new gateway, that's the kind of incremental uh, approach. Now you've got two, a two API gateways in the mix and the ops team, the platform team typically has to know the quirks of both and also know the quirks of how they interact. I've had some quite gnarly problems uh, with a sort of format on the left of the diagram where we had an API gateway passing through to a new Kubernetes API gateway and the old API gateway was stripping out various headers, various like HTTP headers, and that was causing no end of problems in the Kubernetes cluster. And we just, we, you know, we found it really hard to debug where that problem was. It is also challenging to expose all the functionality to each independent microservice team. So it's fine if you could do everything you need in the Kubernetes world in your API gateway, but if you need to modify the other gateway outside, that's typically a raising ticket situation. And, and that can be a bit slow in terms of getting that fast feedback. You should try and push, push as much edge functionality as possible into the new gateway. That's definitely a sort of a, a good thing we've seen. And then you get those like the development teams, the microservice teams can move faster because they can do more things via the Kubernetes uh, config, typically via the Kubernetes YAML. For edge functionality, it does need to remain centralized. Stuff that does need to remain in that existing API gateway, you definitely want to set up things like SLAs. You know, if we raise a ticket and want to open a new port in the API gateway, is like a 24-hour turnaround SLA, for example, 24-hour uh, service level agreement. And then we need to use those SLAs and factor into our release cycle. So if we know we're going to be doing something that, say, opens a new port or does some kind of new protocol support in the existing API gateway, we as microservice engineering teams you know, need to figure that out pretty much up front and then and code that in. Moving on to the second strategy, extending an existing API gateway. Now, this is implemented by modifying or augmenting the existing API gateway solution. I've seen some teams do this custom, do it, do it sort of manually with some Go code or bash scripts or whatever. And there also is support for existing, say, hardware load balancers. And the actual vendor itself has written, say, a custom uh, ingress controller or a custom operator, that kind of thing, that joins the dots between the API endpoints exposed in the API gateway and the backend services. So we as developers, we write our deploy, you know, our deploy and services in Kubernetes. We might put some annotations on there, some other kind of metadata. And when we deploy that YAML, when we do, you know, kubectl apply or deploy it via GitOps pipeline, the ingress controller or the operator looks at the annotations on the services and then out of bound calls out to the API on the API gateway and makes the config changes for us. 
So we're not manually hacking around in the existing API gateway. We're specifying all our routing config in Kubernetes annotations, and then the ingress controller or the operator is automating that update into the API gateway. Now, pros for this, you know, you can reuse existing tried and trusted API gateway. That's why we've seen a lot of folks, you know, building on their own functionality onto the existing API gateway. And you can leverage the integrations you've got with your API gateway with all the other uh, on-premise infrastructure and services. The cons, though, is that the workflow must change to preserve a single source of truth in the API gateway configuration. Uh, we've often seen with some vendors, there's limited config provided by the annotations in the, in the Kubernetes world, too. So is, as much as the dream is to kind of have all your config in the Kubernetes YAML, and then the ingress controller operator calls into the existing gateway and does the changes, sometimes you still need to do those changes out of bounds. And it creates a kind of two workflow model where I can do most of the coding, most of the changing of config in the Kubernetes world, but then occasionally I have to raise tickets with the existing ops team to make tweaks on the, on the API gateway. We do recommend that you shift away from the traditional API UI driven configuration model of the existing gateway as much as possible. You know, still have the ops team offering uh, functionality to tweak the gateway, typically driven by tickets, but you want to push as much as you can into this self-service way of working in, you know, using Kubernetes YAML. And we've definitely seen the, the dangers of this second point here in that you need a standardized way of updating the API gateway that doesn't conflict with what's being specified in the Kubernetes world. We've had a few gnarly bugs with um, folks we've worked with where they have clashes between the config they've got in their Kubernetes world and the actual config being loaded, say, from the existing heritage world. Maybe routes overlap or some kind of conflict in the way the uh, protocols are supported. So you do need to be very careful about syncing up the, the old and the new world here. We also like to say before adopting this strategy, look at an architectural roadmap. Look at where you're going in the future. We do see some folks manually augmenting or, or adding extra stuff into their existing API gateway, not realizing that there's a bunch of other changes coming down the road. More microservices supporting function as a service, moving into a different cloud, a whole bunch of other things that when folks have started sort of um, committing extra code into their existing API gateway, if they paused, they might have realized that moving to strategy three, kind of going a bit more greenfield at the edge, might have been the way forward. And unfortunately, once you've committed resources into this strategy, into extending your API gateway, the danger is you get that sunk cost fallacy where folks are um, already committed now to extending the existing API gateway, and it's not really fit for purpose as you move and adopt more and more of the cloud native way of working. So strategy three, this is deploying an in-cluster edge stack. All of your edge stack now, everything from the WAF to, you know, to the low balancer and the API gateway is deployed actually in the Kubernetes cluster and it replaces your existing architecture or more often than not, this is a greenfield implementation. Yeah, if you've got a bunch of stuff that's already running and making you money outside of Kubernetes, you know, this can be a big lift. Strategy three can be a big lift. We see a lot of greenfield folks approaching this and a lot of heritage brownfield solutions wanting to get towards this space, but recognizing it's going to take them a while to do that. This is simply deploying all your edge components into Kubernetes. Um, the ops team typically owns this and provide kind of sane defaults or some level of guardrails, and the dev teams can configure all components of the edge stack with annotations, with CRDs, these kind of things. Uh, it makes it really nice then, because we as uh, developers on each of our microservices, we can say, you know, um, press different rules for the WAF or this, you know, the CDN, now the caching and so forth. We can tailor individually within the Kubernetes YAML config what we'd like for our individual services, which is very powerful. You know, ops are kind of providing this as a service and we as developers, we simply consume it, which, you know, I like quite a lot. So the pros, you know, the edge management is simplified into a single stack. It's all running in Kubernetes, there's no pass-throughs, nice yeah and it does very much support the the single way of working the single source of truth things like GitOps. GitOps can be challenging to implement when you've got strategy one or two where you've got a mix of things going on because there is often no single source of truth so you know this is very much kubernetes na native way of working the cons are obvious, right? It's a large architectural shift. Asking your ops team, your platform team to move everything into the uh, cluster is a big ask, right? And probably, you know, if you've got existing systems, this is going to be very much an incremental migration approach, probably with like strategy two over time to get towards where strategy three is at. And platform teams often have to learn new proxy technologies. You know, a bunch of folks have been sort of using old school proxies. And then when they rock up to the cloud native world, they're more uh, in tune with things like Envoy. But Envoy is different than, say, some of the older you know, hardware um, load balancers. They have to learn the quirks of how Envoy works compared to their uh, old systems.
The beauty of this stuff, as I mentioned already, is that each microservice team is empowered to maintain their edge config. We can configure everything via CRDs, via annotations, and this removes the burden of raising tickets with the ops team to get things done. The edge stack aggregates all these you know, distributed configs into a single consistent config at the edge. It's very easy if we've got everything in our Kubernetes YAML to look at the YAML and figure out exactly how each service is configured. No longer do we have to look at multiple locations. Um, do we have to dive into a hardware load balancer to understand what's configured there versus what's configured in, in Kubernetes and so forth. I mentioned before, a lot of folks, when they do move this way of working, they don't bring their old systems with them. Often the hardware load balances, it's quite tricky to bring into Kubernetes world. So they do often look at things like Envoy. You know, at DataWire, we know Matt Klein and the Lyft team well. They've done fantastic work. Many other folks from Google and, and other places have built on top of Envoy Proxy now. And it's just a fantastic piece of kit. You know, we've built Ambassador on uh, Envoy Proxy. And so we're all in on, on Envoy. So in conclusion, over the past 25 or so years, API gateways, edge gateways have undergone a series of evolutions. And this has primarily been driven by architecture. We've moved from hardware to software as we've got more things in the back end and more requests are being made in a dynamic fashion. Software is more malleable. We can update it more quickly. It's often easier to scale. It's often cheaper to scale compared with hardware too. We've moved from layer four routing, layer four networking to layer seven. We're now making decisions on routing based on HTTP metadata, such as headers, cookie values. And we can even do really funky stuff like, you know, if a person is viewing this page with a user agent that indicates they're on an iPad of version X, we can route them to this service versus other users on Android say route to this service. So there is an increased demand by engineers, by us as developers to make finer grained routing decisions and that we need the layer seven awareness to do this. We've moved from centralized management, you know, one platform team, one development team to decentralized. Now the platform teams are, are you know, super valuable, but they often provide services to be consumed in a decentralized fashion by individual microservices teams. We need that self-service functionality. As you adopt this cloud native way of working, adopting microservices, adopting Kubernetes, this is a change in workflow in addition to architecture. Microservices are fantastic. They're primarily focused on scaling developer work, independent release, being able to scale independently and so forth. This is a change of workflow. Now we are multiple teams working around a microservices, working around a bounded context. And therefore we do need to scale edge management appropriately. Individual teams, individual development teams need to be able to do a self-service kind of model for consuming what the platform or ops team are producing for them. So we can just say, I want this, you know, WAF configuration, this routing configuration and so forth, all in our way we're normally doing development, which often there's Kubernetes, you know, config files, Kubernetes YAML files these days. We need to support multiple protocols and cross-functional requirements. And again, we as developers need to be able to self-service config how this is set up. You know, we need to say, oh, I want gRPC, I want it configured this way, and, and no balancing done this way, this kind of thing. Bottom line, it's about choosing your solution intentionally. As I hinted at in the beginning of the presentation, as you move to cloud, you know, in terms of cloud technologies, cloud native architectures, cloud native ways of working, you often need to rethink the traditional approaches, the traditional platform components that you used. You can't simply lift and shift your old way of working and you can't simply lift and shift your old technology. Or you can sometimes, but you don't get the full benefits of, of what this whole cloud native world offers. So cho choose your solution intentionally, really think about the needs of, of the edge, really think about the needs of your services and how they're gonna evolve over the coming uh, time. So many thanks for watching the talk. If you wanna learn more, the team and I have put together a PDF and accompanying blog posts and so forth available at the first URL there. We also chat to lots of interesting people, both customers and thought leaders in the space like Katie Gamanji, Dave Sidia, Kelsey Hightower, Charity Majors. We put those up on our, our website as podcasts. Uh, you can find those on SoundCloud or on the Ambassador website. And of course we blog extensively too. So we'd love to hear your thoughts on any of this content. You can find me hanging out in the DataWire OSS Slack channel. You can find me on Twitter and GitHub and so forth at Daniel Bryant UK. Uh, thanks a lot.